Thanks to the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, there is more value to be found in the financial sector than any other of the 11 sectors. Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer Software Tool, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. This is part eight of my 11-part series on looking at the various sectors. And we got a very kind of interesting sector for you today and subsectors, I might add, looking at the financial sector. You know, in 2008, 2009, the Great Recession was primarily generated or instigated, if you will, by some of the financial excesses that were going on in Wall Street. You know, we had collateralized mortgage obligations, people with the loaning money, you know, they could get multiple loans with very little down, and it kind of ran amok. And then that caused a reset in not just the overall market, which we all lived through, but actually the financial services sector. Prior to that, it was not uncommon to see financial stocks trading at your normal 15 or higher earnings multiples. But since that, we've seen a significant change where many of the financial stocks, in fact, in some ways, I would say most financial stocks are actually trading at discounted PE multiples, multiples ranging at 10 to 12 rather than 15 to 18, which would be more normal. So we're going to take a look at that. And I'm going to first start out by going to fast graphs and looking at the screen that I created for the financial sector. I'm going to start by going through the various filters. Number one is I looked at the GIC sector financials. I also wanted primary stocks, not, you know, ADRs, etc. I also then looked for earnings yield above 6%. I looked for an adjusted earnings persistency score of greater than 60%, which simply means that they had pretty consistent earnings growth year after year, a little only moderate cyclicality, if you will. Okay, and that was the you know primary screen I used on the general side. On the historic side, I simply looked for companies that had positive earnings for the last five years. Pretty easy screen. On the estimated side, I looked for total rates of return greater than 5%, so I wasn't looking for real high returns here. And then earnings growth, I wanted it to be positive. And then as far as the regions were concerned, I limited this to United States and Canada. Now, when I ran the query, I ended up with 91 companies. And you can see these are, you know, the 91 companies here that I came up with. Now, there's obviously too many of those to go through in terms of, you know, looking at individual stocks. Again, they all have earnings yield over 6%, which implies that they had P.E. ratios that were maybe no higher than, you know, 16 or so. But primarily, a lot of them had P.E. ratios a lot lower than that. So what I did was I converted those into a portfolio where I took these 90 stocks. And, you know, when I simply hit the button here where I add to the portfolio and I named it financial sector and so on, and I put these 91 stocks in the portfolio. But then I filtered that down. When I went into the portfolio, I set up what I call the financial sub-industry sector, and I broke these down by subsector. And what I did was I went through all these subsectors here, and I picked one or two of the stocks that I was most familiar with or that I liked the best, if you will. Rather than go through 91 stocks, we're going to go through 18 stocks, and I'm going to do it by subsector. So we're going to start with State Street Corporation, okay? And, you know, you can use this pop-up feature if you're a fast grab subscriber, and, and it will give you a description. And they engage in the provision of financial services to institutional investors. It operates through commercial, financial, and commercial real estate segments. And it goes on to tell you where the company was founded, etc. But I'm going to go directly into the fast graph here and look at State Street. Now, State Street, a little different. State Street has actually held its valuations pretty much better than most financial stocks. You can see prior to the recession of 08 and 09, which is right here, it was not uncommon to see State Street Corp selling at even as high as 20 multiples. The orange line on this graph is a 15 multiple the blue line is a 14.3 multiple. But as I look at this, remember, Fastgrass is the tool to think with. I see since the recession, and we had the big correction during the recession, we also had earnings drops, and we also had dividends were cut temporarily during this time frame. We started to see much lower valuations coming out of the Great Recession, multiples around 10 or 12. There was a period of time where I got back to 15. So if I shorten this time frame, to let's say 15 years, which is just coming out of the Great Recession, now I see what I said in the introductory remarks. 
the normal multiple here has been closer to 13 than 15. Now, there are times when it traded at the orange line or above, and there were many times when it traded below the blue line, which was roughly 13 times earnings, or 12.94 to be precise. So we have seen some discounted valuations on State Street. Coming into COVID, you know, we did see a big drop in price, but then we saw a strong recovery. Then we saw flat earnings for 2022, and that brought the stock down again to single-digit multiples again. And then we came into 2023 and we're expecting zero growth again, actually maybe slightly negative from 742 to an estimate of 740 for this year, which remember, we're only a couple of weeks away from this year. But then we're looking for growth to resume at maybe 2% in 2024 and then 12% going forward. The bottom line is this stock is trading at a blended PE of 10. It has an earnings yield of 9.74%, a very attractive dividend yield of 3.3%, which is higher than historical norms, I might add. And it's an A-rated company, and we don't report debt to capital and financials because debt is actually, in many cases, their product rather than the obligation that a traditional company would use. If I go into forecasting here, just to be clear, estimates are expecting a slight negative year this year, down 0.23% from 742 to 740. That estimate has fallen from 794 six months ago, but has risen from 732 three months ago. And it's now expected to be 740. It went down from 741, which was the most previous estimate to where they're currently sitting. Remember now, this has a 1231 forecast, so we're only a couple weeks away, if you will, from seeing that the actual earnings hit. But we're probably 45 days away from the time that they actually report. Keep that in mind. It always takes them something between 30 and 45 days to actually gather and audit everything and so that before you actually see a number for 2023. For the following year, we're expecting a resumption of growth of 2.46% to an estimate of 759. That's fallen from 877. Then it got as low as 755. And it's currently at 759. And then we saw the estimates for 2025. Six months ago, they were $10.00 and they've dropped. So when you're looking at fast graphs, make sure you're using the full advantage of this. Now, if this is true at a 15 multiple, that would give us a 31% annualized rate of return. If we went to the normal multiple, which is for the last five years, the normal multiple has been about 11 and a half. So if it goes from a 10.27 PE to an 11.5 PE, that would still give us a 17% annualized rate of return and with a yield of 3.63%. Now, we've also seen much higher periods for the last decade. You know, the PE has been 13. That would push our annualized rate of return to 24%. So State Street is a very high quality company that's trading at a very attractive valuation right now. And I think it was appropriate for income investors as well as total return investors. And they're an asset management and custodial bank. One that I'm long on and I like a lot would be Ameriprise. This was the spinoff from American Express. I want you to note they have very, very consistent earnings growth. They currently trade at 12.7 times earnings. Their adjusted operating earnings growth rate has been 12.74% over this time frame. If I shorten that you know, to just coming out of the Great Recession, it's actually a little higher at 15%. And you can see how nicely the stock price has tracked earnings ranging between this 12 or 13 PE and a 15.22 PE, which is what the orange line here is. It's using P equals growth rate because it's above 15%. But it's roughly, you know, we're looking at 13 to 15 PE ratios. And occasionally it's gotten a little higher than that, but usually it trades within that range, that corridor or below. At this current valuation, I would call it very attractively valued. I don't consider it, you know, dirt cheap, but I do want to point out that, again, prior to the Great Recession, it was not uncommon to see this trading at 15 multiples or higher. Okay, so since the Great Recession, we've had that reset with Ameriprise, just like we have a lot of others. Analysts expect growth of 11% going forward using the normal multiple of 12.5. That would still give us double-digit rates of return. And again, if I go to the historical numbers here, and you know, I can pick, just to be conservative, pick the last decade, the PE has been an average of 13. That would give me almost a 14% annualized rate of return, including dividend income. So that's Ameriprise. And those are the two asset management companies. Now, I was asked to look at mortgage corps, and I'm not real 
you know, big on these mortgages, but here's Federal Agricultural Mortgage Corp, symbol AGM. And let's go ahead and look at it in the context. You know, it got hurt pretty badly during the Great Recession of 08 and 09, where earnings went from a positive two eight to a loss of eight dollars, but then they recovered pretty strongly in oh nine, and then their earnings have been growing, you know, at a pretty good rate ever since. So again, if I shorten the time frame, since the Great Recession, they've been trading or growing at about eleven and a half percent. But once again, I want you to note that the market has had a penchant to put a very low multiple on it. Prior to the Great Recession, you know, the stock still had a low multiple of nine or ten. So this is a low multiple company. You should be looking at that and thinking about that. So rather than looking at a 15 multiple, which is typically what an 8.61% earnings forecast would be worth, we want to look at it from the normal multiple of, in this case, under 10 times earnings for the last five years. And once again, if I go to the last 10 years, we still get 8.91. This could actually generate a negative rate of return going forward if we continue to see this negative discounting of the stock price you know, value based on you know the, what's happened after the Great Recession. So this one has good growth. I think it's a little overvalued now. I wouldn't be buying this one at these prices personally. But again, it's a, you know, residential mortgage company. Now, in the consumer finance subsector, we have one stock. We have American Express that I'm going to show you. American Express has a pretty good record. It has commanded an actual premium P.E. ratio most of the time. But, you know, it trades between 15 and 16 and a half times earnings. It's currently at 16.19. So if I go to the forecasting graph and look at the 15 multiple, it's about a 9.5% return. A more normal multiple of 15.9 for the last five years would give us 12.87. And once again, you can evaluate the analyst estimates as well as the analyst scorecards. If you're a Fast Graph subscriber, you can do that. Bottom line, I think American Express looks moderately overvalued or fully valued would be a better way of describing it. It's not significantly overvalued, but there's no real margin of safety at these valuations. You know, there was a little margin of safety in October, but that's been about the last time that we've seen a margin of safety. Even with the normal multiple, we still had, you know, a good margin of safety in the stock. The next stock to keep moving on that we're going to look at is a diversified bank. I've got one Canadian bank, the Royal Bank of Canada, one of the, you know, major banks. And, you know, I've got it in U.S. dollars here. By the way, you can go into the settings with Fast Graphs and you can put it into Canadian currency if you chose by simply hitting that and switching it. But I'm going to go ahead and leave it in, you know, U.S. dollars here. And what you again see about a 7.87% growth rate, a little bit of cyclicality. Once again, a stock that tends to trade at a discounted multiple, about 11.9. That's roughly where it's trading at. So I would call this fairly valued at this time. Using the normal multiple calculation of 11.6, that would give me like roughly a 7% return. I don't have a dividend estimate past 2025, so we're going to stop here. That would give me a 7.5% rate of return, including dividends. Long-term growth is expected to be a little better at 5%. So that's the Royal Canadian Bank. It looks attractive with a 4% dividend yield. It's double A rated and has a 4.10% dividend yield, 8.49% earnings yield. So Royal Bank of Canada looks fully valued here or fairly valued. U.S. Bank Corp, which is one of the better diversified banks in the United States, very popular bank, you know, held in a lot of portfolios. Once again, we see some cyclicality. We see some suffering of the excesses of the 08-09 recession. Again, short in the time frame, we've had only about 4% growth. The stock got very inexpensive a couple of months ago, or earlier this year, I might say. It's now been moving back into alignment. We all know what happened with the California bank, the SIVB bank, I guess it was. And that created, you know, a lot of downside in a lot of these smaller diversified banks, although this is a $68 billion market cap. Looking at forecasting, expected to grow about 9% going forward. That could give us a very good rate of return at a 15 multiple, but at its more reduced normal multiple that the market wants to apply for the last five years, it'd be about a 20% annualized rate of return. Moving on, I have one investment banker and brokerage firm, and that's Raymond James Financial, headquartered in St. Petersburg, Florida, in my hometown. This has been a very consistent grower, and it's maintained a 15 multiple, even coming out of the Great Recession. But right now, you can buy the stock at a 13 multiple, 
with an earnings yield of 7.6% and 1.61. This is more of a growth story than it is an income story, but it is a little bit of both. You know, offers a potential for 16.4%, and on a normal multiple, even discount, it would still give you a 9.5%. That's kind of a bad case, good case way to look at it, if you will. But I think Raymond James is investable today. Um, it's not as attractive as it was a few months ago, but it's very investable today. The next stock we're going to look at is in the life and health insurance, and I've picked three of them here. We're going to start with MetLife. MetLife is an A-minus rated life and health insurer with 43% debt. It's trading at a discount to its normal multiple. You can see the market has routinely applied about a 10 multiple to this stock, 10-ish. So when I go to forecasting, rather than look at a normal multiple, that even though we're expecting 17% growth, if I look at an 8 to 10 multiple, which has been historically normal for this stock, and I can pick a 9 multiple here. You know, we would have an opportunity to make about 22% a year, 3.19% dividend yield, A rated or better. So it looks, you know, pretty attractive at this level. Going to the next one is we have Globe Life. Globe Life is very interesting to me because it has an extremely consistent operating growth rate of about 9.5%. Once again, the market has been applying a discount at 12 PE, has an earnings yield of 8.69, a modest dividend yield. But the dividend has steadily increased year after year after year. If I compare this performance-wise to the S&P 500, it's actually outperformed the S&P on a total return, but underperformed it on total dividends. Now, if I go ahead and use the feature here where I can reinvest dividends in both, then I get a little more parity here because the S&P had a dividend advantage. They kind of caught up a little. But anyway, that's Globe Life. I like this stock a lot. The next one we're going to look at in the life and health insurance is the Duck Aflac. Aflac is a classic example of what I was referring to in my opening remarks. Here's a stock that coming into the Great Recession of 08 and 09, it was not uncommon to command very high multiples. But since the recession of 08, 09, it's been basically a 10 multiple company. On that basis, based on historical norms here for the last decade, I would call this stock overvalued here. So if I go into forecasting with only a 3% forecast growth rate and you know, roughly a 15 multiple, that would still give me a pretty attractive rate of return. But if I looked at the normal multiple, I wouldn't be making very much money investing in Aflac here. I own this stock and I plan, I've owned it for many, many years and I plan on holding it. I just don't consider it viable today with any attractive metrics going forward. We would have to move back into a 15 multiple situation for it to be attractive. A mortgage REIT here, this is also, I was asked to look at mortgage REITs. I don't know much about them. The one, only one that really screened up here that I thought was interesting was Hannon Armstrong Sustainable Infrastructure. If I look at it from a standpoint of earnings, which you don't look at REITs with, you know, it's had a pretty consistent record. It got ridiculously overpriced when real estate got hot and we saw some good growth in real estate. But then as the, as the earnings growth started to fall, the stock price collapsed. If I go ahead and look at this as operating cash flow, which is FFO, I get a very spotty record of operating cash flow here. Mortgage REITs are just tough. It's only double B minus. It's not investment grade. Its price has dropped dramatically, which probably makes it more attractive than it's been. But I still don't consider this one you know, necessarily really viable, but it's recovered greatly from you know, bottoming out at around well, it got, it got as low as 13.22 per share this year, and it's now trading at 27. So we've had a, a really strong run up here since, you know, just since October of this year. You know, the stock has gone up 87% and moving back into alignment with its earnings justified value, apparently. Multi-sector holdings is we have one company in that, and that's this Compass Diversified Holdings. Now, when I see a graph like this, the first thing I want to do is get rid of this because this is an anomalous number. That gives me an 11% growth rate. If I get rid of that and shorten the graph time here, now I get a truer picture of what this stock has been. It's been a 2% grower. You know, they, they must have paid a special dividend here and then or, and or cut the dividend in 2021. But they, they're only paying a dollar now versus a dollar 44 they used to. It offers 4.63% dividend yield, by then about a 12 multiple. But again, there's really no growth that this company has achieved, although future growth is expected to improve significantly. But if I look at the analyst scorecard, the analysts have been right most of the time here. So this could be worth spending some time 
getting to know there's no long-term growth rate. But historically, I don't really buy a 9% growth. I think that could be a flash in a pan for a year or two. But I would think this company would probably revert to its normal mean growth of, you know, under 2%. A multi-line insurer, we have one that's Azurant. I'm long this stock, I might point out as well. But I did buy it earlier this year, and I'm actually doing pretty well on it. But it still only trades at an 11 multiple. The market is typically values it at around a 12 multiple. Although if I go into the forecasting, this is a little different. And we've looked at the normal, you know, 7.5% estimated growth would command a 15 multiple. But the normal multiple has actually been a little higher. And if I look at the last decade on this particular company, the normal multiple has been, you know, 14.43. That would give us a 22% annualized rate of return. I plan on holding this stock for a long time. It was a total return investment. It's you know recovered very nicely so far in 2023, and it's almost back to parity. But you, know, you could probably still invest in this stock today. The next one we're going to look at is Arrow. It's a, one of our regional banks. We have t- I picked out two regional banks. And so Arrow Financial has had really good growth. We did have it fall off a cliff here. In 2023, earnings fell 33%. The stock price followed suit, went from a high of 35 to a low of 16, virtually got cut in half, but now it's recovered back up to 28 and looks like it's on track to begin producing some pretty strong growth going forward. Put a normal multiple in the stock of about 12 and we do have a positive rate of return, but again, it you know could have some issues in the short run. Anyway, that's Arrow Financial. Bank of the Ozark is a really... Highly regarded regional bank has a really good long-term track record. You know, it's it's been a 15 multiple company historically. More recently, the valuation has been around 10. That's you know since 200 2019. If I look at this from a standpoint of forecasting, if it traded at a normal say 14 and a half to 15 times earnings, you'd have a 35 percent annualized opportunity. If it traded at its 10 multiple, you'd have about a 17%, 16.7% opportunity. But this would be a good stock to buy now. Almost has a 3% dividend. It's got a slight margin of safety, but it's you know, not necessarily dirt cheap, in my opinion. We have one reinsurer here, RGA, or actually Reinsurance Group of America. During COVID, you know, they got hit pretty hard. Earnings also got hit pretty hard for two years in a row. Fell precipitously, but they're now expected to really recover and get back to a more normal, you know, growth rate of earnings. That would be, you know, kind of trend lining this number. Going forward, analysts expect about a three and a half percent number. Long term, they expect about nine and a half. So, you know, that's makes it look real attractive. Again, it's traded at a discounted PE ratio of eleven. So if I'm looking at forecasting and go to the normal multiple and and the last five years it's been thirteen point three nine. If I go up here to the last decade or so, I get that you know, 11 multiple that I was talking about, and that would put it at about a still give me a 24% annualized rate of return. It's A rated with modest 35% debt. It could be one that you might want to take a look at at this point. It is. It does look like it has a margin of safety and it's very viable. And then I have two transaction and payment processing servers here. The one I like the best probably is Global Payments. They have an almost an impeccable track record. You know, even during COVID, they they still grew, but only modestly. But if you look at their stock price, it has tracked earnings at a 20 multiple or a 17 to 20 multiple. Historically, you can now buy it at a 12 multiple. And it's obviously starting, looks like it's starting to move back into fair value. Forecast is for 13.5% growth going forward. That would, you know, give it, that would command a 15 multiple, which would give us a 27% rate of return. The normal multiple of 22 would give you a 56% annualized rate of return. I think this is an extremely attractive company with a large margin of safety built in. It's triple B minus rated with, you know, just a little bit of debt. Now, last but not least, we're going to look at one that's more growthy oriented, PayPal. I did a video on this not too long ago. PayPal was one that continuously commanded a premium valuation. You can see that by going the scroll bar. It was trading at an average of a 34 multiple. Even here, the PE got up to 60 times earnings. Now, that was kind of ridiculous for the stock. And once it kind of hit that wall and then had just a little bit of weakness in earnings, we saw this precipitous drop where the stock fell, you know, since 
July of 2021, it's fallen 80% in value. However, it is a growth-oriented stock. You can now buy it at a 12 multiple with an 8% earnings yield, no dividend. It's A- minus rated with only 35% debt. It's forecast to continue to grow at 12%. That would give it a 15 fair value multiple, in my opinion. The normal multiple of 37 doesn't make any sense. I would ignore that. I would value this based on a 15 multiple going forward. And at that rate, you know, the stock does look attractive at these prices. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. As you can see, I've covered, you know, I had 91 stocks that I selected. I do want to make it clear that, as I said in the beginning here, the financial sector really has more value than any other sector that I'm going to cover here. So I did come up with all these different names, and I'm just going to let you kind of eyeball them here. You know, I covered 18 of the 91, obviously, for sake of the brevity of this video. But there are some very interesting names in here that you could look at. I did create a portfolio of the financials total return, and I did create a view. You can see on dividend yield, the dividend yields range from zero all the way up to a crazy number on Signature Bank. I'm not sure what that means. But you had some really high yielding stocks in here, some very low multiples and some you know, even higher multiples. But this was my 91 screen. I simply broke that down into the 18 that, you know, that I showed you all in the, where I just handpicked one or two from each of these subsectors. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. You know, this is just another one of my continuing videos. I've still got four more or three more to do. I'll probably do those after the first of the year. So I want to do take this opportunity to wish all of you happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year and prosperous New Year. As we go forward, if you like the video, give me a like, ring the bell, subscribe to the YouTube channel, but also take a look at subscribing to FastGraphs a powerful tool. We've got some really exciting things coming up for next year. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a great holiday. I'll talk to you after the new year.